Yeah. Well, uh, thanks. He's he's moving out and back to Connecticut in and right into assisted living. So there oh, you go. Well, that would be nice. Well, cycle of cycle of life. Yep. So we do. Oh, I saw Logan for a little bit. That would have made quorum. Hello. Oh, I do see him. OK, perfect. You are a quorum, so you can begin if you want to, Mike. Logan in there? Mm hmm. Hi, Logan. Hey, Mike. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, I'm just running between, so I wanted to make sure. OK, so we could gavel in. Yeah. So we got. Five. Yep, so you're at quorum. How many how many members total in the commission? We have um, nine members total. Actually, I think it just went down to eight, uh, but nine for right now. So <coughs> Form, so you are we're good yep you're good we okay kick well in the interest of time uh let's do roll call real quick uh rick we'll start with you um rick member present mike chisholm present christine brinker present well england present matthew schultz present logan dunning present okay thank you everyone uh and uh Thank you. Is, is it is it Dr. Shutkin? Am I saying it right? Um, no, it's William Shutkin. Uh, I have I have a law degree, a okay. Juris doctor, and I'm a PhD dropout. Um, <laughs> but please just call me William. All right, William. Thank you very much. Welcome. Of course. Really appreciate you joining us. Um, we have to quick approve some minutes. So we have the minutes for March 14th, which was our regular meeting, and then we had our special meeting on the 22nd. So I know Christine sent them out for everyone to review any questions or problems. Uh, and let's focus on the March 14th meeting. Um, a motion. We got a motion to approve. approve. Second. We got a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. So move, approve. And then the second meeting, which again, I want to thank everybody who attended that meeting. And that was the meeting where we went through our recommendations to city council. And uh, uh, Christine uh, did a lot of work putting those recommendations together on uh, uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, electronic environmental issues. So uh, does anybody have any questions or thoughts on the minutes for that second meeting? Uh, no problems, no questions. Do I hear a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Okay, was that Matthew? Logan. Logan, thank you, Logan. Yeah. Second. Okay, thank you. All those in favor? Thanks. Aye. 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 Okay, and it's approved. Thank you very much. So, uh, Let's see, we need to up kick things over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, perfect. So now is the meat and potatoes part of tonight, which is um, a discussion with William Shuck. And William, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, of course. Um, I just want to go over a really quick housekeeping before we start. It doesn't look like we have any guests, so this one should be easy. Um, we want to make sure that this time is mainly spent for sustainability commission members to have discussion with um, William. If there does, um, if guests do pop on, we just want to make sure that it's members first and then okay. community after. Um, and then also William was always so wonderful at facilitating and hard stops and meetings. So I do want to give him a hard stop of 45 minutes. I'll be kind of Oh, I see someone. Okay. Um, okay. I will be kind of facilitating and be minute keeper. I'll give a five and ten minute warning, but just really want to be respectful of his time because he is giving us um, giving us a, a Tuesday night, which I feel like weeknights are rough, at least for me. <laughs> so, um, yeah. and, and then I also want um, I know I've kind of been gushing to you guys about um, <laughs> Shutkin for the last the last meeting, but I want to give an official background on him because I think that you'll see that it's just super astounding and impressive kind of all the work that he's been able to do 
Um, so uh, uh, Shrepkin is the principal of Shrepkin Sustainable Living, which is a social impact developer based in uh, Boulder, Colorado, focused on green, mixed use, mixed income, transit oriented development projects. Prior to that, he spent 25 years of his career in the nonprofit sector, advocating, teaching, lawyering, writing and entrepreneuring uh, for social change as sustainable communities. He also co-founded a Boston-based environmental justice law center called an Alternatives for Community and Environment in 1993. And then in 1999, he founded New Ecology Incorporated, which is a sustainable urban development organization based in Boston. Um, from 2011 to 2016, he was president and CEO at Presidio Graduate uh, School in San Francisco. And then prior to that, he was on the faculty of the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, where he was director of the Rocky Mountain Land Institute. Um, and he was also the member in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. Um, he's currently the faculty um, on the faculty for the Masters of the Environment program at the University of Colorado Boulder, which is how I know him, where he leads the Urban Resilience and Sustainability Specialization. Um, and then wrapping things up, he has his AB in History and Classics from Brown University, a JD and MA in History from the University of Virginia, and he completed uh, doctoral studies as a Regent Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, um, and attended the Executive Program in Business Strategies for Environmental Sustainability at Stanford Graduate School of Business. Um, so I also want to say he has a great podcast out there, which I definitely think everyone should check out called The Sustainable City. Um, so again, when does he fit that in? <laughs> I mean, honestly, is that a hobby? Tomorrow <laughs> night, actually, we've got a session, recording session tomorrow night. That's pretty cool. And my graduate students are actually our producer. We, I have a co-host uh, named Andy Bush. We do this with MIT Press, and uh, I have a graduate student each year who serves as producer and and gets paid for the privilege. So it's it's really fun. But thanks it's for asking. Sustainable city. It's called, yeah, it's called The Sustainable City, and it's available wherever podcasts are, are available. Subscribe. <laughs> Great, so, you. William, anything I missed in your bio that you want to highlight before we jump into to discussion? No worries. I think I think you covered it. You know, I, I, would, I would only add, Mel, that I've been in Colorado, in Boulder for 15 years. This is my 15th year. Uh, Although I was in San Francisco for five of those years, I was commuting back and forth. My my kids were here. Um, and the first organization that Mel uh, mentioned that I founded in 1993 is 30 years old this year. So uh, think of me as, as having been in this field now for three decades even. <coughs> And um, also, just to introduce this group to you, uh, William, yeah, this, is, this, is, this is the Sustainability Commission. So they are a resident volunteer um, Englewood resident group, and they really advise the city of Englewood for sustainability. So we have a sustainability plan with goal areas, and we'll kind of field any like projects or anything through them, and they can also kind of bring concerns or or questions to the city and then we can um, try to answer those and make things happen. So um, one reason that we really wanted to have you here was that the city is growing, like I think a lot of cities, but especially cities across the Front Range, and we're seeing some change. And I thought you would be the best person to talk about, you know, what would a sustainable, developed kind of future for Englewood kind of look like? So. The Sustainability Commission members did submit some questions. I thought I would kick it off with one that they had submitted, and then I'll open the floor to them. I do have a list of questions that they submitted too, so if anyone's shy, I can just keep going from those. Um, but one question from a lot of people, I think it's a good way to kick <coughs> things off, um, is just really learning about projects that you've done um, in other places. So maybe highlighting one or two of your favorite ones. I know maybe that's like picking a favorite child, it's just taboo, but if you have any that stick out and kind of positive outcomes that came from that, that would be great. You got it, Mel. Well, a couple of things just before I, I launch into the substance. First, I commend the commission, and by the way, I've reviewed your website, though I didn't uh, get a chance to go deep and, and see uh, about any of you uh, in terms of your bio or backgrounds, but. I enjoyed reviewing the commission's mission and and uh, focus areas, so I applaud you 
for for doing this work uh, as volunteers, citizen volunteers. I also want to applaud you for your excellent judgment in hiring Mel. Uh, <laughs> as your, I believe, Mel, are you the first sustainability coordinator for the city? Yep. yep. That's first terrific. Time. So, so seriously, kudos to you, because as you all, I'm sure know, it's all about the people and especially in in public service and the public sector, you know, finding super skilled, smart folks. Uh, Mel could have probably gone anywhere. And it's just uh, says a lot about who you are as a city and as a governing body that that Mel is with you and that you selected her. So kudos. Um, now to the questions. Um, what I said to Mel is just because of the, the busy schedule that we all have, I wasn't really able to formally prepare anything. Um, but figured this could be a, a kind of informal conversational session. And by the way, if we do go over the 45 minutes, I'm good with that. Um, my wife not, might not be so good with it, um, but but I'm good with it. Um, so no worries if if we bump up against that or, or, or go beyond it. Um, so conversational. Uh, the first question, sort of favorite projects. Well, let me, I'll start with, with uh, one that takes me back because I think it'll tell you a little bit about what I care the most about and, and where some of my own expertise lies. Um, as Mel noted, the second nonprofit I founded in 1999, which is now 24 years old and has over 50 staff in three different states in the Northeast, headquartered in Boston, is called New Ecology. New Ecology was a bookend to the first organization, ACE, known by its acronym, Alternatives for Community Environment, where I used my lawyer skills and that of my colleagues. We had a legal team uh, and advocacy, basically advocating for the interests, the environmental and public health interests of low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color throughout New England, focused mainly in Boston, headquarters in Roxbury, one of the poorest neighborhoods uh, in Boston. Um, and I realized early on in my career as an environmental lawyer and entrepreneur that it wasn't enough just to sue people and advocate for changes and basically advocate for stopping projects, which is what a lot of environmental lawyers do and get paid to do. My interest is and was really in being more creative and more forward thinking about how to do this work, the work of building green, inclusive communities, communities that are full of jobs, uh, full of young people and old people from different walks of life and super green, meaning access to uh, green spaces, really low carbon footprint, walkable, bikeable, connected communities, et cetera. And I founded New Ecology as really the first organization of its kind anywhere to bring green design and development strategies, what you might know as green building strategies like LEED, the US Green Building Council uh, certification system, to developers focused on low-income neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color in and around Boston, who were probably the last in line to get all the benefits of green design and development, but the first in line to get all of the negative effects of polluting uh, development patterns. And that's how and why I founded New Ecology. And the first thing we focused on, we wrote the very first official business case for the costs and benefits of greening low-income housing. It was published in 2003 to national attention and press because we wanted to make the case that you can do green and do it super affordably and efficiently at the same time. That green wasn't just for super wealthy, affluent communities like, say, Boulder, but rather it's something we could do if we do it thoughtfully and well uh, everywhere, especially where the environmental harms are greatest, which again, are our low income neighborhoods, neighborhoods of color, not just in cities, but but in other parts of, of the country, <laughs> other places, rural and suburban. That's how I first got into development and realized that probably the most valuable thing I could do as an environmentalist and as a tree hugger, one of my books is called uh, A Republic of Trees. Uh, I'm that committed and obsessed. The other book is called The Land That Could Be, which is a line from a Langston Hughes poem that actually talks about Douglas County. And are, are you guys in Douglas County or just adjacent to? We're a Rapp just north. Mm -hmm, just north. Uh -huh. What county are you? Uh, Rappahoe County. Oh, you're Rappahoe, right. So, but you're basically same latitude as, right. as, as some of the Douglas County communities. Um, and I wrote that book and it was published in 2000. 
And at the time, you might recall, those of you who were around then, that the big concern and fear in 2000 was that Douglas County would run out of water by when? Do you remember the date? No. no. 2020. Um, all the demographers and hydrologists and environmental planners were like, there's, there's going to be no more water. You know, from Highlands Ranch up to Denver, it's, it's going to be dry. I started to focus on development because I realized that the most effective environmentalist I could be would be one who really tried to build and rebuild our existing human habitat. That is to say our existing cities and towns in a way that would make them both greener and more thoughtfully designed in terms of how people got around from place to place. So we could have less cars, we could have more walking and biking, we could have less commuters and commuter traffic, we could have communities that were more self-sufficient and self-contained in terms of food production, in terms of open space and parks, you know, all the things basically that Boulder was talking about in the 50s and 60s as a pioneer, uh, many of those strategies to this day, you know, sort of cutting edge, but doing so in a way that wouldn't turn, convert those self-same communities into basically Aspen, you know, a super high-end resort where, yeah, people definitely want to live there and go there, but the price point, the barrier to entry is super high. So I've spent the last 20 years basically backing into real estate development as my preferred strategy for being an environmentalist with the central goal of a couple of things, which then gets me to my second project. The first project I took on in a bona fide real estate developer capacity was in 2015 when I was still president of uh, the world's leading sustainability graduate school called Presidio Graduate School. I moonlighted uh, in part because I have a bunch of Denver developer friends who wanted to learn more and do more sustainability projects. And there was an opportunity to do something in Boulder that we figured was going to be both brain damage and worth it. And you probably know that places like Boulder, I don't know necessarily Englewood's uh, sort of uh, hurdles. I imagine they're considerable, but Boulder is probably a top five most difficult place to do development in. Oh, yeah. uh, in, in part because nobody wants it, like most communities. Once they're there, they want to lift up the drawbridge. Sound familiar? <laughs> um, but how can a place like Boulder consider itself really green when really all it's been doing the last 35, 40 years is establishing a very aggressive growth cap on population and building permits and essentially effectively shunting development and growth outside of Boulder City, farther into Boulder County and beyond, resulting in what I'm sure you've heard of, which is a net average of about 60,000 in commuters a day who come over 90% by single passenger vehicle into and out of Boulder each day. We have higher traffic flows coming into and out of Boulder than into and out of Denver to this day. So how can we consider ourselves or any community like Boulder Green when we're basically not allowing more development to happen, continuing to attract a lot of jobs, because of course we, as you know, have a university, and continuing to basically push people out farther and farther on the margins not just of Boulder County, but of course beyond. Well, Larimer, you name it, farther south. Boulder Community Hospital, which employs 2,200 people, the average commuter time by car is 45 minutes each way. So that's, so that's 90 minutes. Damn. And the average commuter, and we're talking basically middle and lower income staff at Boulder <laughs> Community Hospital, um, passes three hospitals on their way to Boulder Community Hospital. Mm -hmm. I know this because the first project I took on is just less than, a, just about a mile from BCH's Foothills main campus. And it's a 15 acre site. It was the largest privately owned, still privately owned site in the city of Boulder when we purchased it in early 2017 after a year's worth of due diligence. Um, we are in about halfway through construction on 317 units of apartments and townhomes, all rental, 25%, 80 of those units are permanently affordable. We also have uh, a, an affordable commercial space program. So 16,000 square feet of our mixed use commercial space, we are going to be pricing 
at a below market rate, not in perpetuity because our equity partner wouldn't allow us to, um, but we're, we're going to get close and we're going to own and manage the property with the city's blessing instead of our housing authority. Um, I'm most proud of that project for a number of reasons. One, it was the most significant project of the last decade and a half in East Boulder. Number two, it led to a new plan, the East Boulder Subcommunity Plan, which basically now, as of two months ago, uh, established an ordinance that opens up our industrial zones for infill residential development with a pretty high inclusionary component that is uh, required a permanent affordability component. Um, and so we're now looking at a bigger project of stones throw away that will allow us to build in an old industrial park, which happened to be purchased for the highest commercial value per square foot last May by a life sciences company called Biomed Realty. Apple's building a brand new 200,000 square foot facility in that same park, and we'd like to build uh, another mixed income project of roughly the same scale as, as just across the railroad tracks. And we've created the first ever partnership with Boulder Community Hospital, giving them the right uh, to up to 30 units with every leasing period for their middle and lower income workers, who are most of their administrative staff, it's about 80%, who are earning um, uh, the area median income for 60% of AMI in Boulder County is about $50,000 for a household of one. We have apartments for, at 60 and 50% of AMI. So that's basically families made up of, of uh, administrative staff, maybe junior nursing staff, uh, and, and other what we now call essential workers who, but for this kind of creative leasing, simply can't afford to live anywhere near Boulder when the next wildfire or pandemic should strike. So does, is Mel, is that, I know that's a, 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 a fulsome answer, but does that give you enough? Yeah, I think that answers I the see a question, question too. I, I have a question, I'm sorry. I, this is a hot, hot topic in Englewood right now. I mean, it is the hottest topic. I bet, yeah. And my, my basic question is, how do you convince developers to build at that kind of AMI in that kind of, of uh, environment? I mean, that that's almost, unfathomable in my mind or how did yeah. you do it yeah great question can i ask your name and, and just quickly oh, I'm your rick. background i'm rick emel heights yeah great rick are you in in real estate or anything to do with it or planning uh i only because i've gotten involved in some of the uh efforts in the area toward uh, converting r1 uh zoning and so right. it's it, it, it that has rolled right into affordability and attainability issues which we're stuck on right now Great. Thanks, Rick. It's a great question. I mean, I, I basically have a simple but provocative one word answer. And that's density. Right. The boogie, okay. the boogie, right. The boogie person of all of all communities. You know, most communities don't want to be as dense as Manhattan, as Hong Kong, as Tokyo. Understandably, I don't want to live in a community that dense either. Um, but there is a middle ground between, say, Boulder's density and Manhattan. And, you know, it looks something like Colorado Springs um, or even Fort Collins, both of which are far denser, more urban than is Boulder and don't claim to be nearly as green as Boulder does. So so part of what I do for a living is, is try to hold communities like Boulder to account for how green they really are once you start to reframe and redefine what it means to be green, and I just gave you a little sort of hint at, at how I look at it. So, so how do you do it? Well, you just mentioned, Rick, the essential sine qua non, the if it doesn't happen, it ain't going to happen. And that's reopening our zoning codes and surgically converting, up zoning, if you will, but surgically, thoughtfully, carefully, especially single family zones, which would include in some cases rural zones, but also, as I just said, Rick, industrial zones. It doesn't just have to be currently or formally residential. A lot of this can happen on old commercial or industrial land. Think of all the malls and office parks, especially if commuting patterns work from home, et cetera, continue and technology continues to improve and blah, 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 blah. 
we are overbuilt retail and commercially. The Flatirons Mall on 36, as you probably know, is, has been in conversion now for three years to bring some housing to that dying shopping mall. So open up with thoughtful people, uh, your council, your planning board, your city council, volunteer students who wanna be open-minded about this, who aren't coming in just to trash it and say, no way, not in my backyard, never <laughs> could happen. To say, look, 83% of Boulder's current residential land inventory is zoned exclusively single family. It's illegal to build anything other than that. Yes, we have a new ADU law as of five years ago, but it's so friggin' complicated that city that city council is is revisiting it this year to simplify it. Because of course it was gerrymandered. It was Jerry rigged, I should say, not gerrymandered. <laughs> it it could have been that too. But the first time around, everybody got their hands on it and was so freaked out that they were actually going to allow granny flats that they made the law so complicated that it makes our existing zoning look streamlined in comparison. Mm -hmm. So look at your zoning, 75%, 75% of all U.S. residential land. It is illegal to build anything than a detached single family home which is the most inefficient form of land use. I live in one, I'm sure we all do, I love it, it's great. Um, but if I'm really serious about my carbon footprint, about solving for climate change and water use in the West, and you all probably just saw the headlines in the paper today, the Colorado Basin states are all gonna have to, according to the Biden administration, split up water use evenly among the seven states, as of, as of today's proposal by the feds, which is sort of akin to SB 2013 that Polis has just put forward, housing now. Basically what Jared and the state are saying is, we can't rely on our individual municipalities, what do we have, over 270 in Colorado, to figure out their housing solutions and strategies in a concerted, coordinated way. Everybody's foisting their housing needs off on someone else, it ain't gonna, it's not working. And we therefore need state intervention, which is of course what California did starting four years ago. And then they upped the ante two years ago. So basically California leads, the rest of us eventually follow. It's a collective action problem. So if the city of Englewood can figure out a way with Mel's help and your help to surgically change, improve, I would argue, some of your exclusive single family or rural or industrial zoning districts to allow for thoughtful infill, A, and B, at a density that actually allows a developer not just to build market rate, but then to use that market rate premium to subsidize the inclusionary. That's how it works. Yeah, we can rely on low-income housing tax credits, 4% tax credits, 9% that CHAF administers, but they're super competitive. They're a lot of time and paperwork, a lot of administrative work that goes along with them for you as a city and for us as a developer. But if you get the densities right, and if construction costs start to moderate, and if the land price is reasonable, and you got a great community like Englewood, as far as I understand, high quality of life, people love living there, meaning it will appreciate over time, then chances are you could find savvy developers who with or without a low income housing tax credit could meet a reasonable permanent affordability standard, let's say between 10 and 20%. Boulders is 25, one of the highest in the country. Broomfield just instituted a year ago, a 20% inclusionary requirement. And you build in some flexibility to the inclusionary, but you allow us to build enough units, apartments, townhomes, probably no detached single family, though maybe a couple of tiny homes, and you fill them in strategically and beautifully and you get great design standards in place. And then suddenly you're filling in your downtown parking lots and old you know, retail and commercial, and you're attracting a younger demographic like Mel who don't wanna have to get in their car to go everywhere because now they can walk to the bar or restaurant or grocery store and the grocery store will now wanna be there because people can walk. That's what Longmont is finally starting to do on 287, which is a ghost town but they're now starting to you know, re-examine their zoning and figure out where they can put mixed use projects on top of surface parking lots. 
that make sense? Yeah, the, I, it, it, you're kind of preaching to the choir on a lot of this because I'm I'm totally into what you're saying, but I I, I just uh, our, our biggest bugaboo is that they're talking you know 100 percent AMI to get it to get a developer to even want to listen to this uh, on on you know one of four units or something like that. I, I don't want to dominate this versus a lower AMI, Rick. I'm sorry. Versus a, a lower AMI. Yeah, I mean yeah. something that's reasonable. But yeah. Well, so that's if I can add to that, Rick, because it is such an important conversation and, and feel free to shut me up at any time. And as I say, we can go past 730. Here, here's the here's the challenge. And as one of my developer colleagues likes to say, you know, development isn't rocket science. It's harder. Now, putting Donald Trump out of your mind completely and, and all the other terrible developers who like in any industry and in any business field have done a lot of crappy stuff, which is the problem with development is it sticks around a long time. People see it and they form their opinions around that. But there's also a lot of beauty that we've created. And when you get social impact developers like me who care as much about the environment as any other tree hugger, we care about beauty, we care about environmental sensi uh, sensibility, but we also deeply care about great urbanism. What, what are the communities, what are the places people wanna live in? And I don't care whether it's a rural town, a suburb, or a dense downtown urban area. The same kinds of principles to planning and design apply, which is do it thoughtfully with humans and the environment in mind. Here's the, here's the conundrum, and one of the many reasons that this work is so challenging at any kind of scale. I'm not talking about flipping houses or you know, building billionaire pencil towers in Central Park West. I'm talking doing, you know, legacy development in communities like Englewood uh, or Broomfield or Fort Collins, the Front Range, Colorado Springs. Low income housing tax credits, which is our means as of 1980s of making it a little easier for developers to build permanently affordable units, only apply for AMIs, as you might know, Rick, at 60% or below. Okay. The real challenge, which isn't to say that low income and moderate income housing is not a real challenge. It is crisis. But the really big challenge, because there are no policy supports, is middle housing, middle income housing, as you probably know from your experience and have seen in the latest housing bill, 2013. Um, that's because there's no policy support. There are no incentives, namely tax credits, that help offset the costs of constructing and then selling or renting those houses at a loss. And I'll give you an example. The 25% inclusionary program that the city of Boulder implemented as of July 2019 or 2018, effective 2019, uh, requires 20% at 60% of AMI or below and 5% basically at 120% of AMI or below, preferably 80 to 100, Rick, the same AMI level you were talking about. But nobody's doing that. Um, the city allows for you to opt to do your, your additional 5% back in the low range because the city realized that it's hard to require something where there's no financial relief available whatsoever. We tried to build, of the 22 permanently affordable townhomes we're building, at uh, the Weather Vane Arapahoe project, um, we would have lost lost three hundred thousand dollars per unit on a for sale product with each of those townhomes in the red, which fundamentally undermined our pro forma. Even for a hundred and forty million dollar project, when you're losing three hundred thousand <laughs> on a sale, you you can't get financing. We had eighty local LPs from Boulder County, from whom we raised fourteen point six million. The second capital raise was principal insurance out of Des Moines, the most conservative green real estate fund in the country. They would not have underwritten that kind of loss. They did underwrite 80 permanently affordable units with no LIHTC because they believed in us and in the project and they loved the front range in Boulder. So it's really hard to do missing middle. The way you do it is you allow for more density and you work with your developer in an open book format have him show you his or her pro forma. Tell him what you need. If you can raise money, if you can float a bond to help support it. You know, Boulder 
at the tip of a hat will raise money and tax itself for buying open space. You probably all know that. It's no problem for us to acquire a three to $5 million parcel of land several times a year and tax ourselves for it. The idea being that's a community benefit. Well, isn't it a community benefit to have fire people, teachers, healthcare workers able to live in your community? Isn't it a community benefit to have your kids and your grandparents be able to live in your community? And I say that as a lawyer, and the answer is yes. You could make a colorable case that this is and should be a, essentially a targeted or protected class of uh, homeowners or renters for whom support and subsidy should be available. That's the argument. And communities are starting to get bold because it's a crisis. So necessity is the mother, the mother of invention. And people are now saying, look, our community without fire people and police people and teachers, let alone kids, is no community at all. We're going to start doing something about it. And it's not just, you know, the zoning. That's key. That's the first step. Remember, ideally, you're providing financial support, some kind of subsidy per unit to make it happen. And maybe you buy down the mortgage at first. Maybe you cap the capital gain, the appreciation on the, on the product, which is a typical strategy for any for sale development. <coughs> Tons of techniques. This does not require invention. It just requires political will and creativity. And the people who are doing it are making headline news as like, you know, the new champions of society, figuring it out. Other states, nation states have solutions. It's called social democracy. They provide a safety net, they guarantee housing and healthcare and education, and they basically don't worry about it. And as a result, their people tend to be a lot less stressed out than, than we Americans are. Matthew, I see your hand raised. Do you want to go? Yeah, um, William, I'm curious. So I think one common issue we have in our city is there's um, an aversion to density. Affordability is one issue, but then we also have not as much resources or money as we would need for really critical infrastructure product projects that are directly related to climate change. So I live in a house that was part of a flooding event that happened here in 2018, uh, a hundred year storm and our infrastructure was really inadequate. And as a result, there were deaths in my neighborhood and all mm -hmm. the houses around me were really severely damaged and flooded, but we have a lack of resources. They've fixed the pipes in my direct area, but there's still a lot of work that hasn't actually been prioritized or done. And a lot of it has to do with lack of tax base. So. Of course, I'm all for affordability, but I also think that sometimes cities don't understand that density could actually lead to tax base that could fund these projects that we're going to need more and more as climate change becomes more and more of an issue. And so in your experience, what's your advice for helping people understand that or how has that played out in your work as far as the tax, the upside of, of higher density from a tax perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, there are no simple answers. Boulder's a paradox. We have so many resources. We have a rich tax base. We have high impact fees. We have one of the highest commercial impact fees in the country. It's escalating up to, uh, I think it's 30 is the high. Palo Alto is the highest in the country. I think they're now at 37 a foot. Um, we're able to do that. We're able to tax ourselves, you know, blah, blah, blah. And yet we still struggle to build these projects until until very recently. Your situation in some ways is even more challenging. And by the way, that that 15 acre site. Sits in a floodplain. Uh, the neighbors to the south were some of the hardest hit in Boulder in 2013 with our biblical flood in September. We had to do a letter of map revision. The city was at risk of losing its FEMA flood insurance if we did not pay $250,000 to remap the 15 acres, which we agreed to do. Um, so intimately familiar with flood issues and infrastructure, super important. So what does that, what does that mean for density and, and budgets and priorities? Well, you know, first, this is a great opportunity for Mel and the Sustainability Commission to research into the IRA as well as the state's 
uh, new housing policies and climate policies to access funding. There's a ton of funding out there. You've probably already started that process. Um, but the city of Englewood should be on the case for flood, flood mitigation and infrastructure for, for all sorts of climate action projects, which could be sort of grouped under those categories, which are now being funded and will continue to be funded for at least the next two years that if uh, Biden, uh, as long as Biden's in office and for that matter, Polis. So I would really go after and devote some of your commission resources, namely Mel and staff and even you as volunteers, to looking into funding opportunities to help pay for some of that infrastructure, okay? Number two, and, and doing things like changing your zoning laws. We're talking about a, a, a nascent inclusionary housing program as part of an application for funding will help you because grant reviewers, proposal reviewers are basically looking for inclusion and equity as key parts of any funding proposal under in this political climate under this administration. It's not only the right thing to do, it's actually advantageous as a proponent of a project or of funding. So check that out. Um, secondly, there are all sorts of efficiencies to multifamily infill housing. You've got much less per capita per unit cost for infrastructure than you do with you know, your typical subdivision built on the outskirts of town, from new roads to sewer to water to electric utilities to school districts. Now, you also have renters who aren't paying you property taxes, but you do have a property owner, assuming it's a for rent kind of project, but you're getting efficiencies. And to the extent what you're doing in providing that kind of rental housing, assuming it can't be for sale, in a downtown setting, is you're providing for a workforce to be able to live closer into town which theoretically allows your businesses to be more functional, to stick around longer and to pay more taxes, theoretically. Which gets to my final point, which is just really good financial modeling for, for your treasury, for your, your FISC, your public uh, funds. I don't know what sort of modeling exercises you do each year. Boulder has a pretty good sophisticated uh, uh, method for developing their annual budget. <laughs> which includes, you know, really good prioritization and scenario planning for their investments. And indeed includes things like, um, you know, ambitious inclusionary programming, um, uh, uh, climate reduction strategies like, you know, more buses and more bus passes and subsidies. <coughs> of course, we also look to private developers in Boulder to, to do a lot of this funding. Um, and so I'm, you know, for you thinking about impact and review fees, which no doubt you have and, and do, you know, where can those be tweaked, but met with incentives like changes in zoning, which arguably at least up front don't cost you anything, but then you can model the effects, the fiscal impacts of build out. So what would it be like to build out 200 to 300 units of rental housing downtown over say the next five years? and you know, get your good uh, finance staff to begin to figure that out. What do you lose in services? Remember too, that many of these aren't big families moving into small apartments, right? They tend to be younger people, single people, or uh, uh, empty nesters, and, and therefore the potential fiscal impacts might be more modest than you know, if we're talking families moving into a 2,000, 2,500 square foot uh, house and you know, a new subdivision. Is that responsive, Matt? Yeah, thank you. So good fiscal analysis and, and everything from zoning changes and what that might unlock and enable, which includes size of units and what kind of households you're looking at. Yes, we all want families to come, but we also want essential workers. We also want young people who don't have families. And a lot can be determined by the nature of the zoning and the nature of the development or building that can happen in those zones. Not all of it is expensive, you know, uh, single family. I do see a guest hand raised, but I want to make sure that members get a chance to ask any questions if they have some. Any over, Christine, I see your hand raised. 
Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you more about the apartment complex that would have several hundred new apartments in East Boulder. I was wondering if those will have new fossil fuel connections or if you looked at making those uh, uh, have some electrification. Great, great question. Um, indeed, um, all of the residential units will be effectively all electric. So we'll have a half a megawatt of solar. Uh, so 500 kW solar system rooftop, um, and that will provide most of our um, residential load. Because we're gonna have a restaurant <coughs> on the ground floor of one of our buildings, um, and because frankly, when we started planning and engineering the project five years ago, it took us six years, it took us six years to get the project in title in Boulder, which is not unusual. Um, a pandemic, huge, huge increase in construction costs, and, a, and a, a continued push toward all electric buildings. My other project is all electric at 30, 30th and Pearl, that's 300 units and permanently affordable commercial space, 120 permanently affordable uh, residential units. So effectively, uh, was it Christine? Yeah. Um, think of it as, as an all electric residential project with a gas hookup off the street for the restaurant. Um, and ideally at some point we'll be able to turn that gas off and, and run the, the facility with you know, all electric induction. You know, most restaurateurs still want gas. So from, our, from a leasing perspective, we are hesitant to go all electric right now, but every year you know, the technology gets better, it's great now. Um, and more restaurateurs like the green halo effect of being able to say to their their customers, you know, we're an all electric kitchen now, but there's still a marketing appeal to to a gas stove. And can I ask a follow up question? Sure. What advice would you have for other communities like Inglewood for starting to move more in that direction? Yeah. A great question. It is the trend. And again, Mel would be a great researcher for you. I think she might have even done it for one of my courses. <laughs> you know, the, the 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 progenitor, the precursor cities were Belling and Washington and Berkeley, California. So starting eight years ago, they were basically reforming local codes, energy codes and zoning for all electric buildings, commercial, residential and other and uh, institutional. Um, there are now dozens of cities who are who are moving that way, including New York City. But I think it's a transition. I don't think it, you know, one night you, excuse the pun, flip the switch. The challenge right now for all electric is it is still more expensive for the developer from a construction point of view. Because of the, the question, where do you get all the electricity? Where do you get all the electrons from? Uh, especially in an urban setting, you can't get them all from a rooftop. The rooftops are too small. Oftentimes they're not at the appropriate orientation. You can do a lot with, with uh, insulation and, and so-called passive house standard buildings where you've got super tight envelopes, much less reliant on, on energy uh, 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 requiring mechanical systems. Um, but still that, that tends to be more expensive and has its own limitations. Uh, it's hard for us to do ground mounted solar, even if it's on a big site, which is to say you need a big site in part because of XL utility regs and, and transmitting from even a hundred yards away to, to your users. Um, so there's still a ton of barriers, Christine, to doing purely all electric. I think the transition strategy is to have your city staff, you know, really schooled up on best in class policy models for all electric development, all electric construction, so they can meet in an informed way with developers, some of whom will not be as schooled up as they are, so they can brainstorm effective strategies and potentially funding pools to offset what are still premiums for certainly for all electric, but even for majority electric, figure out how you might be able to power, you know, summer all of your residential program, and then if it's a mixed use program, rely on more conventional fossil fuel energy sources, and basically plan for a transition, say, over the next five to 10 years, because it's happening fast. The IRA will likely accelerate, you know, by, by a multiple, maybe two to three X, the rate at which we uptake renewables 
be that at the industrial scale or residential. Um, so I think that's probably the best approach, transitional, but well-informed. And again, the commission could do a lot for the city in basically learning about who's doing it the best of a comparable city size. What, what are you guys, 30,000? We're about 35,000. 35,000. So other small cities, you know, Palo Alto, a big university town that considers itself very smart, but also uber expensive. I think they've got a super aggressive energy code, roughly the same size, 40,000 people. You know, talk to a boulder um, if you're not already. And I don't want to assume that you're not already doing this, but you can learn so much from what others are doing. <laughs> and so many of their staff and electives would love to share it with you. And someone like Mel and your commission is the perfect broker for that kind of knowledge and information. Great. Um, Steve and Tiana, any questions you all have that you want to ask? Mel, I see one from Luciano. Oh, did you want to start with, with your or finish with the commission? Oh, yeah, I just want to make sure all members had their questions. But yeah, Luciana, if you want to ask your question, feel free. Hi, it's actually Dana Liebert, and that's my husband's account I'm on. Oh, hi, Dana. Hi. hi. <laughs> Not trying to sneak in here. <laughs> I also have problems, so I can't turn my camera on. So um, thank you so much, William, for what you're sharing. Um, sure. I'm a ecological landscaper. Cool. And I think that what you said just that um, development needs to be done really strategically and carefully to not harm our our eco you know urban ecology further um, in in terms of things like urban heat island effect, um, having permeable landscapes to uh, mitigate flash floods. Um, and just biodiversity loss. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could give some just really specific advice for what, what you mean by strategically and carefully mm -hmm. and um, any cities, examples of cities that have done this well. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Uh, was it Dana? Dana. 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 Yeah. Thanks, Dana, yeah. not Luciana. Um, <laughs> So a few things. First, I think the, the science is well established. And my own view is that there's nothing more environmentally harmful and wasteful than sprawl. Continuing to spread out across farmland, across forest land, with cars, I don't care whether they're electric or gas, and until the grid is fully green, which will probably be 30 years, um, depending on where you are in the country and the future is not evenly distributed. Um, there's nothing worse for the environment than <laughs> continued sprawl. At the same time, we've given ourselves you know, so little option. The, the idea, I'm sure you've all heard the phrase, drive till you qualify. Whether it's downtown Englewood or downtown Boulder, it's just too expensive now. So we, we got to keep driving and developers will respond to that demand. And they'll find ways to, to get land uh, taken down and under contract. And the next thing you know, the, the prairie you know, continues to, uh, to sprawl out. So what I mean by surgical is just the opposite. Looking at our existing built environment within our municipal boundaries, or for that matter, county boundaries, where we've already got much infrastructure, maybe not all of it to Matt's point, but we've certainly got more than we've got on the prairie or you know, in, in the mountains. Um, look first to those sites. Now we know we're over parked in part because of our parking requirements, right? Historically speaking, at least for the last 50 years, you know, looking at parking ratios of two to one, I, I do, I, I've got the statistics somewhere and I recite them often, but I just can't remember them now. But, you know, we basically have like seven parking spaces for every car. I think that's the, the data uh, in the average U.S. city and town. So we're over parked. This, in my view, the smartest cities in the country, which now include Longmont, are looking first at their surface parking facilities, all those lots. And they're saying, how do we demolish that asphalt 
and put something productive and human on on that space. You know, we have tended literally to privilege in our zoning cars over people. So let's, uh, to Rick's point about examining R1, examine your parking requirements and look to those sites in your downtown where, you know, the parking lot sits empty half the time or more than that. Um, that's surgical. Figure out what the zoning is. And if the zoning doesn't allow you to build a three or four story apartment complex with a restaurant or office space on the ground floor, then change it and change it for the whole area. And yes, do a public process and spend some time and blah, blah, blah. But basically say, this is what smart communities are doing. Englewood would like to be smart. I'm not saying you're not. I'm just saying, if you haven't done this yet, do it um, and do it as quickly as you can. Because in the meantime, when you're not doing that, while you're not looking, you know, just go check out Erie, Superior, East Boulder County, I-25 corridor all the way up to Fort Collins and what's going on, you know, to the east and west of that corridor. To say nothing south. And I, I drive to New Mexico quite often, so I, I, I know where you guys live. I haven't necessarily been to Englewood recently, but the same thing there. So I think you've already kind of started to really get your heads around your hands around the, some of these solutions and it starts with the zoning how do you make sure it's affordable and inclusionary how do you make sure it's ecologically sound well you you encourage the use of per, uh, you know pervious pavers and rain gardens for water catchment you make sure you you're implementing the latest flood mitigation measures which you know are expensive but you want your project to be safe and, and stick around. You talk about and encourage your developers to consider rooftop and or ground mounted solar, assuming you guys have a, a good solar program already in place. Um, and the state, you know, we are one of the best states in the union for working with municipalities and encouraging um, uh, installation of renewables. Will Tour, our, our head of our energy office is, is the best. <laughs> He's just an amazing human. So make, you know, take advantage of, of, of him for that. Find ways to improve your transit. Do you guys have a bus system in Englewood? Yes. Yes. Great. So identify those, you know, key bus stations and nodes. See how many housing units are within, you know, walking distance, so-called 15 minute neighborhoods and start to fill in the blanks. And Matthew, this goes to your point, um, you know, get your, your fiscal planners to look at what it would be like if you added 500 units over the next, say, five to 10 years within walking distance of your uh, bus rapid transit or your, your bus station nodes. 15-minute um, neighborhoods is the planning concept du jour. It's actually come under some fire from all sorts of crazy people. But the bottom line idea, whether your community is smaller like Englewood or larger like New York, is you have areas designed where within a 15 minute bi bike or walk, meaning you don't have to get into a car, you can access essential services from schools to grocery, dare I say it, even uh, you know a gas station <laughs> uh, or some other uh, utility. Um, let's say EV charging in this case. So you know the 15, 15 minute neighborhood concept, it's been in place in Boulder for 10 years. We're just starting to take it seriously. And the way you start to take it seriously is you look first at your zoning, because most zoning doesn't allow. It's illegal to do a 15-minute neighborhood in most parts of your city if you're like most American cities. So it starts there. Thanks, William. I know we're at 7.30. I think we have one more question, if that's okay, from our, our chair, yep. Mike. Um, yeah, William, this is, I'm going to show you my naivete, but uh, What's happening in Englewood, and I've, I've joined Rick in, in learning, there's a gap between the sterile uh, monopoly board with little boxes on it and a plan and a code. And in R1, we're talking about corner lots can have four units and one will be, we're, we're looking at little greenhouses blocks and and then we talk to people like you and we hear things about really cool, creative design. 
you know, it, when you see that or you envision that, you can get excited. You could say, that's cool. I, I, I could live next to that. That would really enhance my neighborhood. So there's this black hole between this sterile uh, community development planning, and I'm not criticizing Engel with community planning and development, I'm saying there's this cookie cutter sterility to a zoning discussion and a map with a plat, the distances and little boxes on it. And then you look at places like Bellingham and Palo Alto and you see these amazing designs where you, <laughs> you go, it's really cool. There's nothing wrong with that. I would love that in my neighborhood. How do you bridge that gap? How do you get yeah. a city to say, we want creativity, we want design, we want to put incentives and creative approaches? I think one of the problems is the citizenry just can't get excited and it's, it's intimidating and it's scary to think of these little monopoly blocks coming into our neighborhoods on an end. four corners on my block. So I'm going to have four, four units on my block. And the whole discussion goes off the deep end. So how do you do that? How do you bring those visions together? Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and there are answers. Um, so first, one of the gigs that Mel didn't mention that I did for several years was I ran a foundation. It's what brought me to Colorado because our technology team was here in Boulder. We invented a technology called Community Viz, which was at the time the first 3D, 2D scenario planning software, GIS software for envisioning a community based on different development and fiscal scenarios, policy scenarios. Um, we competed with Google SketchUp. Google eventually bought SketchUp literally down the street. But there are now today, and Mel could, Mel, did, did you take a GIS class when you were here at CU? I did, and I avoided that like the plague. <laughs> okay, got it. Well, and yeah. you you might even have a GIS specialist on your staff. I do. Um, yeah. So really what you could do is you could even download for free some some cool software. Was it Mike? Yeah. Um, that you could play with basically computer assistance design CAD software or a product called Reddit. And there are tons of them now, some of them very expensive, but some of them less so or free, where you can actually start doing the design yourself. Take a real block, like a parking lot, like I keep talking about, or even a cool residential block. And what if there were really, you know, three cool, uh, I ran a modular company on the side for a while and we created something called a power pod. It was a 500 square foot butterfly roof, solar powered little pod that today, you know, would be all the rage. We ran it, we ran it into the ground in 2010 because of the recession. Um, you could do a, a year long, and again, I don't mean to add to Mel's dance card, you know, <laughs> ridiculously, but what if, what if Mel did a six month, you know, charrette process, <coughs> you wouldn't even have to pay anybody. And you you organize a group of your your fellow citizens, you know, to spend six months, uh, two nights a month, envisioning and using CAD to actually imagine some some building designs and massing, whether in a residential neighborhood or downtown. That's number that's number one. Like you could be super creative and super scrappy, low cost, and do this with a lot of volunteer labor under the auspices of the commission. Secondly. You know, you you do what everyone else does. Uh, you, you hire a consulting team who, you know, if they're good, it's not cookie cutter. They really listen to you and they develop a set of scenarios, including pictures and, and uh, you know, serious, beautiful diagrams that allow you to begin to envision what it would look like. And again, the challenge communities like Englewood have, as I understand it, is as you say, you've got a lot of folks who are afraid of, of that change. They hear all sorts of stuff, you know, but younger people less so, right? So, and I'm not gonna <laughs> fall into the trap of telling anybody how old they are or <laughs> assuming how old anybody is. But, you know, it's a different vibe today. My own kids who are 21 and 25, like, this stuff is second language to them, um, even though they lived in a rural Vermont farmhouse. Um, talking about good urbanism, talking about not having to drive everywhere, 
talking about how cool it would be to, you know, be able to walk to a bar or restaurant, talking about having like a bodega on the corner in your single family neighborhood, even, you know, something as simple as that run by a local family who could live above the storefront. How cool would that be? And you could build that as a two story, 2000 square foot building with a thousand square feet of a bodega that sells great coffee and, you know, bagels and frozen foods and candy bars. And the young family that runs it lives upstairs. All of it is possible. All of it is designable and financeable if you can, if you allow for it and encourage it. So you start with the law and policy and planning, and then you, you know you go from there. Right? So figure out a budget, hire a, a firm to come to you a year from now after you've done some outreach, some stakeholder engagement, after you've come up with some ideas, after you've maybe made a little more progress on rezoning R1 or on accessing funds from the state or IRA for you know new uh, uh, swales and culverts. And then maybe think, you know, let's start with this particular part of Englewood downtown, or maybe this one neighborhood. And maybe you begin to do a kind of a PUD process, a plan unit development concept where you allow for a lot of flexibility and freedom, all pointed toward a bunch of goals that are no doubt already in your comp plan that says you want to be family friendly and you want young people to live there and you want, you know, people to have jobs there or be able to work from home and, you know, great design and great parks and all the rest. And then start with a bite-sized part of your, your, your city and go from there. Thank you. Thanks, William. I know we kept you a little bit over. I really no, appreciate it. No worries. It. Super fun to do it. Fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's always a pleasure to talk. I mean, I think I, we could all just listen to you for hours, but yeah, have absolutely. a great night and apologize to Jenna for us. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. And thanks. Good luck for all of you to all of you. And again, I appreciate what you're doing. This is hard work and you're doing it as volunteers and you've got a terrific paid staffer. Uh, whom I've given 10 years worth of work just tonight. <laughs> so, so Mel, make sure you're you're sticking around for 10 years and then we'll then I'll come back and I check. I have no plans to leave it, so that's good. <laughs> Thank you, Thank Thanks, Okay, man. you guys take great night. luck, okay? And I, I'd be happy to answer any questions by email if you've got specific things and uh, always, always want to help All where right. I can. Good luck, everybody. All right. Thank you, Thanks, William. Again. Cheers. Bye. My favorite. <laughs> it's interesting how uh, he's even opened up my eyes to uh, different avenues and places sustainability commission can look to or consider or think about or study. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Park all the parking lots. Yep. <laughs> the big ones. Yeah, well, there's no parking in Angle, but that's one of our biggest issues. Anyways, that was very good. Thank you, Mel. Uh, yeah, I got to digest it. There's a lot there. Uh, but let's get back to the agenda, and we can always talk more at the end or, or stay over. So, um, and uh, chime in and, and help me out oh, here. Perfect. If I miss uh, so, anything. I got these first two actually. Oh, so, okay. April 17th. The EV, the Electric Vehicle Action Plan, is going to go in front of City Council for potential adoption. Just good so you work all on know, that, by the way, that was a good job. It was a team effort from everyone. There was a lot of resident business, a lot of outreach to folks. So really, really happy with it. Hoping it gets adopted. Um, and then on April 22nd, we have our Earth Day celebration at Grow and Gather from 12 to 3. Um, and yeah, I think that'll be really well. Good as well. I didn't hear from anyone that they wanted to table for the Sustainability Commission, so I have you guys as a no. Let me know if that changes, but that's totally fine if you all just want to actually have fun and just be patrons. <laughs> but that's all I have, so then it's you. Okay. Um, on May 25th, we picked that day as our cleanup day for the Biotar project over at the rec center, and on, a, and on the 25th, that'll be raking and cleaning and cutting with clear all the leaves and the debris out of that area. Uh, so if anybody can help, that would be great. I don't think that's going to be hours and hours. It's just uh, put your work gloves on and grab a rake and they'll 
have plastic bags we can stuff everything in and then once it's it's clean then we'll be ready for the planning may 27th is a saturday that's memorial day weekend and uh, we will have the flowers there and we'll have the biochar uh, on one side and on the other side we'll have uh, compost and we will plant flowers and uh, we want we'll have a, i think we're gonna have a lot of flowers to plant uh, and so uh, i'll be the master of ceremonies i volunteered to be the taskmaster so i'll warn you in advance again i'm hoping this won't be hours and hours i i had one thought of just getting a post hole digger and going around and digging holes and then people would just come in with their with their compost and their plants so we'll figure that out when it happens so we'll probably have uh, uh some tools and some hand tools and stuff there so uh love to see everybody there and uh, maybe we can have a burrito and a cup of coffee or something. I already confirmed. <laughs> <a> yes. Thanks, <laughs> Mel. <laughs> and are we going to get a sign? We are getting a sign. So there's going to be some kind of indicator on the biochar um, plot that just says this is in partnership with the Sustainability Commission and um, the Parks Department. Yeah. Um, and yeah. It would be Great. Great. Well, thank you. For yeah, sure. of, course, thank, of course. Some of you have already told me you'll volunteer, so thank you in advance. And even if you even if you don't want to work, just come on over and see what we're up to. And we, we won't chase you down or uh, make you do anything. But I, I hope it's fun and I hope it's interesting. And I suspect there'll be a lot of questions and answers. Oh, by the way, here's some biochar if anybody wants to look at it. <laughs> That's the actual stuff we're going to be using. Um, let's move on to the May meeting. Uh, ideas, uh, grid alternatives. That yeah, so I, I put this up there just in case to see you all were interested. So Grid Alternatives is a nonprofit um, that services Arapahoe County and others, and they offer completely free solar to low income eligible homeowners. They also have other like job programs that are really wonderful and amazing, and they're very fitting because in the updated sustainability plan, um, oh gosh, I should know this off the top of my head. We switched it. I think it was your suggestion switching it to um, really partnering, working more, partnering with organizations that are already doing solar and helping accelerate that in our community um, versus kind of like installing an entire solar farm, which just seems much more feasible. <laughs> so that's an option if you guys want. I can reach out to them to see if they would come present. Sounds interesting. Yeah, I love it. yeah definitely. I'd like to hear Great it. Idea. Uh, Matthew put his thumb up. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Mm -hmm. Great. And please, anyone, if you have ideas for the May meeting, Contact Mel directly, contact me. Uh, I think there's definitely a combination between learning and doing. Christine? Uh, could we get an update on the M on the uh, energy code? Um, we know that they're adopting it in May and June, so see if, if we could uh, maybe view a draft of the language that'll be proposed or something like that again before um, it goes to city council. Mm -hmm. that, that, that would be enlightening. So by then they should have some things done or decided. So it'd be nice to know. Um, also, <clears throat> um, I'm pushing, so slow me down if you want, but Logan had mentioned to me that he and uh, Kara had uh, had some discussions and concerns about uh, the lack of perennials in some of the city design and landscape and i'm paraphrasing and also um uh, the lack of pollinators uh, why aren't we landscaping and using more so for example at the rec center those are all annuals i love flowers they'll be beautiful but you have to ask yourself why don't we put some native plants and grasses in there so uh i think the question was how do we raise that? How do we bring that up as a topic? Uh, because I think as we look into the future, it just makes all the sense in the world for Englewood to move in the direction of pollinator gardens and native plants. So I can have that be a follow up question to Parks, saying that it was presented by the Sustainability Commission, yeah. and then that can be an update in the May meeting. I, I think we need raising awareness, and and there could be more to it than what some of us understand, but. Uh, I think the pollinator garden uh, that is over at Depot Park is incredible. 
I go over there every now and then. It's just starting to green up. It's it's really cool. It's it's happening. If you get a chance, go over there. And you look at that and you think, well, why don't we do this more often? I mean, all minimal maintenance, no watering. What what part of this am I missing? You know. So, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah I, Mike, I, I I just noticed that I think Adrian and this group put out a the all call for anybody to to do the plots in the uh, uh, the parks. Okay. And um, typically it's like Lions Clubs, work rotaries, things like that, mm -hmm. and jump in on that. But the bottom line is, is that I know by Bellevue Park, it's all it's all annuals, you know. And to be honest, if we know what annuals look like about halfway through the summer in Colorado, <laughs> they're crappy looking, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas if we went with more of a a, a staged sort of mm -hmm. um, uh, perennial uh, uh, water water resistant kind of thing. I think that if we put a proposal together that that would benefit in a lot of ways. So what do you think, Mel? Just, oh, just raise please. the flag and ask Adrian and company if, if there's any way to incorporate that into their rather Rather than planting annuals again, you know. You know just every year, to, if you added a percentage every year, it wouldn't be long before you had uh, some nice. And you can go over to Depot Park and look at which plants and flowers you like. But it's, I, I think if we're going to be sustainable, I think we really have to raise the flag and uh, ask for people to pay attention to that. Uh, anything else that needs to be talked about or chewed upon? Okay. Holy cow. <laughs> so staff's choice is zero. Commissioner's choice is zero. Uh, council liaison's choice. I hear no takers. You're <laughs> rush. <laughs> so, so if if everyone's comfortable with it, I say we adjourn oh, this meeting. Oh, we have a public forum. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, this is an opportunity for. That's Diana. Oh, it's Diana there. She's LL. Yes. <laughs> Diana, Diana, speak to us. Hi. Just, uh, I, I won't go on. Thank you for bringing up native plants. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> I won't go on about that because I have before, but I am happy to come um, with information about that. But I raised my hand to say, when you're doing the biochar project, if I may give you the suggestion, make sure that it is well irrigated before planting day so that you can dig holes without a big struggle. Okay. That's, that's key, that it's moist. You don't want it super saturated because you'll be walking right. and compressing it, um, right. compacting it, which you don't want. And um, a, a, the plants will be small, so a post hole digger will be make much too big a hole. But if you have um, strong cordless drills um, and an auger, you can just, and, and the soil is moist, you can just power through and um auger drill a lot of holes and if you're bare root planting you don't need to dig big holes okay that's what we like to hear that's good news <laughs> that's good news thank you and one more thing um the the leaves and all that that you're if you're having um if you're doing organic wood mulch um that all that material can become mulch it doesn't need to be hauled off okay. I'm with you. The only question I had, and I have to work with the city on it, is um, uh, who and how will it be ground up? And uh, I, I I don't know if the city has a little I can grinder. Ask, I can ask Adrian that. I mean, they it, can, they'll bring you wood, wood mulch. They'll bring plenty of that. Okay. Um, Maybe we can trade can, them. <laughs> yeah, or if you have a, I have an electric mulcher that you just, put the leaves in and it, yeah. you know, turns it into mulch rather than going to a landfill. That's I, all. I will do the best I can. I, I, I'm i still learning what resources the city has and what their procedures are. So I'm trying to uh, get along with them as well as I can. And uh, okay, Parks is the best. Yeah, they're, they're great. Adrian's a great guy. So we'll, I hear you. Everything you're saying, I agree with Dana. And I just have to wave my magic wand and make it all happen. <laughs> cool. Okay. Anything else? 
there's no further business, I move that we adjourn. Perfect. Thank you, folks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'll miss you guys in May. Ken's going to be was, here. I've got yes. <laughs> I got to think about this. You know, it was just so relevant. He put such a positive spin. It was sounded hopeful. You know, we just kind of dread this. Yeah. Right. He is a good dude to listen to. I you know, a monopoly board is depressing to me. Well, of course, it but there's there's a development in Englewood, and as the crow flies, it's south of Maley. <laughs>